it's, it's funny. Uh, we talked about the progression of the series. And Johnny's like, I don't know if you felt this, but it just like keeps on getting better and better every week. I was like, yeah, I feel that too. He's like, yeah, and you're last. And I was like, no pressure. Yeah, yeah, no pressure at all. It's good. It's good. So I, I absolutely have loved this series. Have you enjoyed our guest preachers? I mean, I think it's awesome because here's the thing is that, like Johnny said, he just said, hey, get a word from God for our church. And they've all been consistent, right? And it's been building, and it's been a, a, a constant message of who we are and whose we are. We are Discover Family Church. You know, I'm going to be preaching this morning on urgency. I don't know if you know what urgency is, but it has different meanings for different people. So urgent is an adjective, and it means literally a calling for immediate attention. In other words, we need this now. Like, it's not for the future, but we need it now. And this, this has different senses, and I'm just going to get rid of this because, let's be honest, I'm not going to sit down. But we have different ideas and different senses of what is urgent at different stages in life, Right? Any of you have toddlers in the room? Have any of you ever had toddlers? Eh, okay. The most urgent thing in a toddler's life? Potty training. I mean, that's urgent. Number one, for parents not to have to buy diapers anymore. Praise God. My kids are out of that stage. That is an expensive stage of life, especially if you have more than one in diapers at a time. But when I toddler needs to go, guess what? They need to go. There is nothing else that you're going to be able to talk to them about, nothing else that you're going to be able to distract them with. They need to go. Can you hold it? No. It's urgent, right? And then we get into the teenage years. I have to talk to that person on the phone. Well, that was my day. Well, I have to text that person. I have to follow their Instagram. But what if somebody else sees their Instagram before I see their Instagram? What if they like it before I like it? Sometimes, for some of the guys, that's, they need to go to urgent care, right? <laughs> we do stupid things when we're young sometimes. Sometimes those things cause us physical injury. And then as adults, sometimes some of us still haven't learned. And we still need to go to urgent care because we did stupid things that caused us physical injury. No names. Um, Whoever you're thinking about, it's okay. Just don't say it out loud. But also, as adults, sometimes we prioritize those things like work, career. Those things become urgent. Like, I have to do this. I have to get this done. I have deadlines. These things are important. So much so that they're so urgent that they take a place of priority in our lives. I have to get this done, so that means I have to stay late. Well... I mean, sometimes that could be true, depending on your job, but also what, what's your priority? Because urgency isn't just a matter of what it is, but the priority that you place on it. Oftentimes, the urgent takes place of the important. You know, I, I love the saying, and just so we, we clear the air here, I'm in HR. I'm in human resources at a local institution. And one of the phrases that we love to say is, um, lack of planning on your part doesn't constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> it's like, I know this is really important to you right now. However, you knew about this a month ago and said nothing. So lack of planning on your part doesn't mean it's an emergency on my part. I got other important things to do right now. But we oftentimes will allow the urgent to be in a wrong priority. So what we want to talk about today is actually getting our priorities straight when it comes to urgency. What actually is urgent and important? So the big idea of today, we, the church, and this is a church with a capital C, so it's not just Discover Family Church, but the church exists to experience the love of God and to share it with those around us. And since that is our purpose it has to be our priority. 
If we're not doing that, what are we doing? We have to exist to love God and love people. We have to exist. It has to be our priority. It has to be urgent to share the love of God that we have with those that don't yet have it. I mean, we got to do that in order though, right? We have to know who we are in Christ and whose we are. We're his. I love the message that Pastor Damon shared with us last week. I loved it. Not just because I got to be on stage and he pulled on my belt, but um, man, he like really leaned on me. I don't know if you know that. Like he was like really leaning on me and I was like, I hope I can do this. Yeah. But he had such a timely message for our church. He was reminding us of our purpose. He specifically mentioned and talked about our name, Discover Family Church. And so I just want to encourage you today, if this is your first time here, it doesn't matter who you are, you have a place here. We exist for families and to be family to those who don't have it elsewhere. So you can be a single person living far away from your extended family and you have a family here. You can be a college student living away from home. You have a family here. You can be someone who has so many extended family members around the area that you can't even count them and don't necessarily want to be around them. <laughs> be our family, right? You don't want to be around your family? Come find family here. And then bring your family here. Because we can be family. So for those who are isolated, those who feel alone, those who feel rejected, those who feel like a square peg in a round hole, those who have been hurt by people in the church in the past. We are Discover Family Church. Here, you can discover family. And so... We know, as a leadership in this church, that God put us in this place at this time for a purpose. I talked to Johnny the other day, and he's going to be sharing again about how we ended up here. You know, not just like how we became a church, but how we ended up literally in this building, in this space. And let me tell you, for those of you that know the story, it's super encouraging it is totally a God thing. For those of you that don't know it, you'll be encouraged by it, by hearing it. It's important to share testimony of the faithfulness of God in our lives. So, you know, how does this all go with urgency? Well, we first have to know who we are and whose we are in order to have the proper heart to know about the priority of our urgency. Number two, because we know who we are and whose we are, we should be excited. Y'all seem very excited. We should be excited. Why should we be excited? Um, I happen to know, not to point anybody out or make them raise their hand or anything, does, we have an engaged couple that goes to this church. You don't have to raise your hands or anything. But how many of you remember being engaged? If you're currently engaged, you should definitely remember it. Just say. Otherwise, marriage counseling is free for charge for you. Um, but I remember my engagement. And it was like, man, I can't wait to get to spend more time with John. No. Your pastor lies. I hate to have to have to share that with you. But I love my wife. I love my wife. And when we were engaged, number one, it was way too long. We were engaged for a year and a month. Way too long. Number one, it's way too long for a bride-to-be to change her mind about things. Yeah. FYI, FYI, <laughs> way too long. Plus, I mean, she's doing all the planning anyway. That's just how it works. Don't get mad at me. She didn't want all of my opinions anyway. So, but when you're engaged, how many engaged 
women do you know? They're like, I don't want to show anybody my engagement ring. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of like someone who runs a marathon, right? Like, how do you know if someone's run a marathon? Oh, don't worry, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. Like, you don't have to worry about knowing. They'll tell you. How do you know if a girl's engaged? Oh, don't worry. Oh, did it catch the light just right? <laughs> just make sure it's always facing the right way. Like, you're gonna know. Right? Like an engaged couple, rightfully so, is excited about it. They're looking forward to that day, which goes by so quickly. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, that was just a day. Okay. Like now, now the real work happens, right? Now the real marriage takes place. Like everything else is like, and then that day's over. Okay. So engaged people just know it's still just a day. But you should be excited. You should have butterflies. Well, it says that the church, capital C, the church is the bride of Christ. Are we showing off our engagement ring? Are we excited to share with people that there is a day that it's coming where the groom comes to pick up his bride, where Jesus is coming again, and we're going to be caught up in the clouds with him. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17 and 18, it actually says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let me tell you. Eternity isn't just about later. Eternity starts already. Eternity is outside of time. We don't have to wait to be excited about eternity. Jesus came to give us life and to give it more abundantly now. As soon as we want to access it, as soon as we surrender our own lives and let him take control. We can have that presence of God with us now, in our lives now. He's coming. But how often do we actually encourage each other with that? Are you down? You having a problem? You have circumstances that discourage you? Hey, let me just remind you, you're the bride of Christ. Jesus is coming again. And there will be no more weeping, no more tears, no more disease. And we've got the answer. The answer to every problem. The answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's nothing else. If we don't get excited about it, then do we really believe what we say we believe? I would contest, better pray about that. So getting to the urgency part, if we believe what we say we believe, then shouldn't we want to share it? Shouldn't we want everyone to know? Shouldn't we be that engaged couple that tells everyone, oh, have you met my fiance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, married way over my potential. I can't even argue with that. So that's the thing, though, is that we should have that same excitement and more so about the fact that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, about the fact that he calls us his own in our muck, in the mire, in every sin that we've ever committed, knowing the deepest, darkest secrets. He loves you anyway. I find that incredible. I find that so close to unbelievable, knowing my own muck and mire, knowing my own past sins. But I got great news. And because I got great news for me, I can share that great news for everybody else. 
Because if he can save me, I know y'all didn't know me in the early 2000s. Some of y'all did. But for those of you that didn't know me in the early 2000s, God can save me. He can save you. A little too much enthusiasm on the wrong points, but we're going to move forward. (laughs) So I've referenced this before, but I'm going to talk about it again. I don't know if all of y'all know who Penn Gillette is. He is the Penn part of Penn and Teller. They're magician comedians. They got like a Vegas show. They're super famous in the magician comedian crowd, if that's you or not. But Penn and... They had a show that I can't say the name of here on this stage, Um, but it referenced a cow, male. Um, But anyway, so Penn, Penn and Teller, Penn Gillette is the talking head of the group. Teller literally is silent for, like, that's part of his shtick, right? But Penn talks a lot. And as it turns out, in his personal life, he's also very outspoken about the fact that he's an atheist. He talks about it very much. And yet, and it was several years back, he put out a a little video just on his own little channel. And he talks about receiving a little Gideon's New Testament Proverbs Psalms dealio like you would see in the hotels. That there was a fan that waited after him, you know waited after the show to talk to him and just gave him this little tiny Bible and wrote a personal note in it. And this man is an atheist, a professing atheist, one that talks all the time about how, you know, God's not real and you shouldn't have faith. But what he said about this man, and I think so many times we as Christians, as believers, think, oh, well, people like look down on us or have an issue with us or they'll argue with us. But what he said about that man. He said, you know, at first he approached me and he knew my work. He knew me. And he was genuinely complimentary of what I do. You could tell he knew the tricks. He, he was very, very complimentary that he had been following me for a long time. And second, I could tell that he was sincere about sharing this with me. And then what he said really blew me away. He said, if you truly have faith and you don't share that faith, I don't respect you. As an atheist, this is what he said. Because he said, if you truly believe it, how much would you have to hate someone to see a truck bearing down on them and not warn them to get out of the way? How much? Let me tell you, eternity is so much more important. Eternity is so much more important than the temporary. Hell is so much more important to avoid than that truck. So our urgency comes from loving those around us that are still searching for what we've already found. Our urgency comes from loving people enough to share with them about the love of God. That friend or coworker that isn't a believer, uh, maybe my, uh, my awkward interaction kind of puts me off. Well, I'm putting my own comfort level in priority over that urgency. That's the wrong priority. Any of you see the the Jesus Revolution movie? I saw it. I thought it was great. I don't know if you saw it or not, but uh, it it was a really good movie. And uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, played by Fraser, I mean, Kelsey Grammer, Um, was talking to Jesus, no, Jonathan Rumi plays Jesus in The Chosen, Lonnie Frisbee, so it can get a little confusing if you already know all these other things, but Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee are talking, and Chuck Smith is the pastor of a dying church, 
that looks a lot like other dying churches might look like in the 70s with everybody with suits and ties and, you know, preaching a very particular brand of, of the gospel. And literally, he talks to his daughter, Chuck Smith talks to his daughter and says, look, I just don't get this whole hippie movement, right? I just don't get it. I don't understand it. He's like, and she's like, but dad, there's something there. There's something there. And he's like, well, God is going to have to deliver a hippie to me in order for me to try to understand it, have a conversation. So whether it's true or not, I don't know. But his daughter finds on the side of the road, walking along, this hippie, and across the back of his coat, it says, Jesus loves you. And she's like, oh, better pull over. Picks him up and takes him home. She's like, you have got to meet my dad. And so the first conversation that they have in the movie, I love what Lonnie says. Because Chuck Smith is asking him a question. He said, I just don't get it. Can you explain to me, like, about you and your people? And he's like, I like that. My people. He's like, you know, everything that we're doing is a quest for God. Because Lonnie knows he found Jesus. He said, everything that we're doing is a quest for God. There's an entire generation right now searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. Let me tell you, that's still true today. They may not be looking in the exact same places as the hippies, but replace drug culture with materialism. Replace, you know, free love, make love not war with, well, sometimes still the same. But also a perfect Instagram, all the perfect shots, perfect perception by others. People place a priority on perception of others over real foundational truths. You know, I I heard it said a long time ago, uh, we make things look pretty to impress people that we don't even like. (laughs) Where is our urgency? Where is our priority? You know, people today are searching for God but they call it a lot of different things. They're searching for fulfillment. They're searching for meaning. They're searching for purpose. They're searching for the meaning of life, life at its very essence. Once again, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the meaning of life. Jesus is that fulfillment that we can have in our life by following him and surrendering our lives to him. People want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They just don't know where to find it all the time. They're searching for something that we already have. Shouldn't we share it? How, How cruel is it to have something that somebody needs and more than enough of it in abundance, and be like, I know they need it, but eh. If you were a part of a clinical trial to cure cancer, you had cancer, you got this clinical trial, and it cured you of cancer, and then you meet somebody else that has the same cancer, Eh, I don't know if they'll believe me. Really? Ah, they might look at me funny if I tell them that there's a cure for cancer. Really? Let me tell you, that person is desperate. They'll be willing to try anything. And whether they know it or not, the world is desperate for truth. And they're willing to try anything, and they do. They try everything. To fill the void in their hearts. 
But if no one tells them, how will they know? We have the truth. We have the answer. We have the cure for spiritual cancer. Why wouldn't we share it? You know, it'd be like just a crying shame if I didn't share at least three C.S. Lewis quotes whenever I get to preach. That's not a magic number or anything, but... You know, whenever we share our faith, I know evangelism is this, like, word that can, like, have different connotations. But I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. What we practice, not, save at certain intervals, what we preach is usually our great contribution to the conversion of others. It doesn't take always shoving something down somebody's throat. In fact, I highly recommend get some prayer in your life and get some direction from the Holy Spirit before you actually try to verbalize those things. But what we should always be doing is living a life in such a way that it exemplifies the love of God so that people can look at it and be like, what do they got? Like, I talked to them the other day, and they seem so joyful, but they got all kinds of stuff going on in their life just like me. Like, how do they have peace when they're also facing this financial difficulty? How do they have joy whenever they also have a family member that's going through a difficult surgery or a difficult disease? How, do they, how are they able to have patience with their children whenever my kids are the same age and they're doing the same things and I can't stand it? How do they do it? We have the answer. Why wouldn't we share it? We have the answer. You know, all too often, I think that, and this is going to be harsh, FYI, just kind of, just kind of preparing you for this. So mentally prepare yourselves a little bit because it might sting. It stings me a little, to be honest. You know, uh, I don't know if you know this, but whenever preachers preach, um, it's not like, I have this figured out and I'm preaching it to you. It's, hey, I'm walking the same life too and I'm preaching to all of us. But sometimes, sometimes we have this wonderful life that has been provided to us. But we live in timidity. We don't share it. And even worse, sometimes... We look for the things that they have. We go after the things of the world that are already not fulfilling them. They're already trying every different way, and we're like, we kind of want to try that. I, that kind of looks fun. Like the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, I'd like to give it a shot, though. Right? I can't see if I love it or not if I don't got it. Let's see. Let's give it a shot. It's funny, but it's not. Because we look at what we don't have. And we don't focus what we do have. We don't focus on the miracle in our life of Jesus and real life change. You know, I think there's a reason why the extremely rich and famous oftentimes are the most depressed. Because they got everything that everybody told them would make them happy. But once again, C.S. Lewis, if I find myself with a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. But God, I just, you know, this this thing would make me happy. This thing would help me out. This thing, like, I want to praise you in the storm, but Lord, help it stop raining. But at the same time, if you have Jesus and, it's not the gospel. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the answer. Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Jesus plus doing good works, not the gospel. Jesus plus being charitable, not the gospel. Jesus plus, hey, if you just satisfy my rent this month, not the gospel. 
We need to focus on what is important, on the eternal. You know, oftentimes we pray for all of these other things. Third C.S. Lewis quote, FYI, meeting my quota. God cannot give us a happiness and a peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing. If we're looking over what the world has, what the world tells us is important, we're looking in the wrong place. We have to take care of our own priorities in order to have the proper urgency. But maybe you're saying, Pastor Jeff, you know, I don't really have like a high position. I don't really have like a platform. There's no way I'm ever getting on stage because I don't like public speaking. Oh, you should have seen my first tries at public speaking. Or actually, no, you shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> like literally, I was stuttering and like sweating and all of these things. And I was at a church and I was just doing announcements. But literally, I looked out and I saw all these people. And it was not a big church. And I was like, I know each and every one of these people. And each one of these people are my friends. And what I see in all of their eyes right now is pity. I'm sorry I'm making you feel bad for me. <laughs> like, literally, it was that bad. And you know what happened the next week? Pretty much the same thing. But the pastor kept on letting me do it. <laughs> And guess what? As I did it, I got better. But maybe you're saying, I'm never going to do that. Like, did it once, it was terrible, never doing it again. It's possible. But in Acts 1.8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. So in that verse... The Greek word, because we're in the New Testament here, so the Greek word in Strong's Concordance is dunamis. Dunamis, that word for power, means a force, miraculous power, specifically for doing miracles. Ability, abundance, meaning, might, power, strength. That is what we were promised. You know, we're going through Acts right now on Wednesday nights. Highly recommend it. Johnny put a plug in for it. We're going through the book of Acts on Wednesday nights right now because that was the start of the church, capital C. Jesus had told Peter, upon you I will build my church. And the early church started when Peter preached a sermon after the upper room. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and he went and preached. And they went from 120 to 3,000 all at once. First mega church was the first church. And then numbers kept on being added and they went to 5,000. The church. But that same power, that same Holy Spirit is available to us today. You know, it set the stage for Peter and John to heal a beggar. He had been a beggar at the temple gate for 40 years. Everyone knew who he was. Like, oh yeah, that's beggar guy. I recognize him. And they got to him and they said, look at me. And he's like, oh, these people go and give me money. And they said, silver and gold have I not. I don't got any money. But what I have, the spirit of God living inside of me, what I have, I give to you. Get up and walk. This man who had been lame, begging for 40 years at the temple gates, gets up and walks. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it gets around. Because everybody knew who this guy was. And like, what is he doing walking? Like, I just gave him money last week. Is that right? Like, yeah, I mean, 40 years, that's kind of a long, a long time to fake it. You know, like, 
how much are you really getting? Is it really worth it, right? But they all noticed. They all could recognize him. And it gets back to the religious authorities. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. They bring Peter and John in. Whose name did you do this in? How arrogant do you have to be to question a miracle, right? Like, hey, you, performing miracles, how dare you? I'm the religious authority. I know I haven't done any miracles, but you shouldn't have either. How dare that guy now be able to walk after 40 years? Come on, guys. Seriously? But they pulled him in. They said, whose name did you do this in? I love their response. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They don't stop there. Whom you crucified. You got it wrong, buddies. You crucified him. He rose from the dead. He gave us power. And now we can perform miracles in his name. We are the church. That was the start of the church. That's us, people. We can perform miracles in his name. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be empowered to get over that awkwardness and tell that workmate, to tell that neighbor. We can do it because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. I love what it says in Acts 4, 13 and 14. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Do people recognize that you have been with Jesus? But seeing the man who was healed, standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. When God does a miracle, that is the best witness ever. When God changes your heart, that is the best testimony ever. You can try to say what you will about my God, but I know what he did in me. No one can argue that with me. You can try. It won't work. You know why? Because I knew me in the early 2000s too. I knew the me that I was, and I know the me that I am. And The thing in between was Jesus. That's it. I can't tell you how many Facebook messages I got from people after I joined in 2007. Oh, kind of taking my age a little bit here. Um, That knew me in college at USF. And they were like, is this the same Jeff? Like, I see some of the things that you're posting. Is this the same Jeff? You kind of look similar. But is this the same Jeff? My answer is no. I'm a different Jeff than I used to be. You knew me, who I was. But if you want to get to know who I am, I'm more than happy to share. Why? Because I'm not the same person. I have hope. I have freedom. I have what you need. You may not even know it. But I have what you need. And I'm more than happy to share it. I love Peter and John's response. Because the religious leaders, after they figured out that they couldn't do anything to them, because the mob would have come up against them. They said, okay, well, we're going to give them a stern warning. Do not go preaching in the name of Jesus anymore. And in verse 19, they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We can't help it. We saw it. We've seen the miracle. We watched Christ ascend. We know. We can't help but talk about it. When was the last time that you couldn't help but tell your friend about what Jesus has done in your life? Man, y'all are not excited this morning. But you should be. Jesus has changed our lives. Jesus has given us a way to eternity. 
Do we believe it or just say it? Do we believe it truly, 100%, wholeheartedly, all in? I'm with Jesus. It should be. It should be all. He gave us his all. We should give him ours. Okay, getting back to the urgency. I know, like this message about urgency, but we're, we're building to the urgency. I believe that I personally was on my way to hell. And Jesus stepped in, snatched me, and put me on the right path towards heaven. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. If I truly believe that, if I truly believe that, that means I also believe that there's people who are still on that path to hell. How much would I have to hate them not to let them know? Why is there urgency? Because we have love for those who still don't know. Because there's people that we love that don't know the truth of Jesus. There should be urgency. If you knew, and by the way, nobody knows the day or the hour, not the angels in heaven or even the Son, but only the Father knows the day and the hour of the second come. But if you did, and it was at 5 o'clock today, number one, praise Jesus, I don't got to go work on Monday. <laughs> right? I don't got to worry about that bill. I got no concerns, right? The earthly thing shall pass away. I don't got to mow the lawn anymore. I don't got to fix that thing that's broken because everything is new. Praise Jesus. But what are you going to do? You're going to fix that thing? Man, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Why would I fix it? You're going to mow the lawn? Why would I do that? But what are you going to do? Do you have unsaved loved ones? That's beyond a shadow of doubt happening at 5 o'clock tonight. I'm getting with them. I don't care what you think about me. I'm telling you, there's an urgency. You've got to know. Why? Because I love you. I don't want you to miss it. I got news. No one knows the day or the hour. It could be 5 o'clock. Could be. I don't know. You don't know. But you've got to have a sense of urgency. How do we apply it? Land in the plane. If we truly believe that we have the answer, then loving people means sharing that answer with them. We're supposed to love God, love people. Two things. That's it. It's simple. But it's not easy. That's why we need the help from the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to have our own priorities in order. That's why we need to be seeking after the things of God more than we seek after the things that the world tells us are important. Are we seeking after God's presence or are we seeking after material things? Do we say, I got what you need? Or do we look and say, do I need what you got? Let me tell you, there needs to be a sense of urgency. Why? Because God said that he loves each and every one of us. He's not willing that any should perish. Why are we? Why are we willing? We have to love people. We have no excuse. The disciples were uneducated common men, but yet went from 120 to 3,000 in one day from what they preached, those uneducated common men. Why the Holy Spirit? So there's no excuse. Well, I don't really know that I'm that good. I don't really think that. 
don't listen to me. I don't really want to jeopardize that relationship. I don't want to, I, 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 me, me, me. What if it's about someone other than you? What if it's not about me? What if it's about what God wants to do through me? What if it's about God reaching into and taking people out of hell and putting them on the right path? I love what Pastor Damon said last week. He said, when's the last time that the, any gates chased you? But he said, upon Peter, upon you, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church unless we stand and do nothing. If we stand and do nothing, that gate in front of me isn't worried. It's not getting knocked down if I'm standing still. The gates of hell will not prevail when we push through them. When we reach in and take those people out. When we have the urgency because of our love for people. That I'm not willing to let you stay there. I'm not willing to allow you to stay on that path because I know that God has so much more for you. We have to have urgency. So let's bow our heads. Father, Lord, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, if there's anyone in this room that's listening that said, wow, yeah, I don't have that. Lord, touch their hearts. Lord, help them to understand that you love them without any kind of condition. Yours is the only completely unconditional love. You loved us while we are yet sinners. So without any looking around, and I'm not gonna make you come to the front or anything, but if you need Jesus in your life, if you want Jesus to do what he's done for me, if you're on the other side of that gate right now and you're like, I need the other side of the gate, just raise your hand real quick. See that? You can put it down. Now, if everyone in your heart, just follow this prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord, give me proper priorities and proper urgency. But Lord, I acknowledge that I need Jesus in my life to forgive me of my sin and to give me a new life. Thank you for what you've already done for me. I want to follow you and I want to do great things for your kingdom because of my love for you and because of my love for others. In Jesus' mighty name. And if there's any of you that say, man, you know, I just don't have that passion right now. My heart doesn't break whenever I talk to my unsafe friends. I don't have a sense of urgency, but I want that. Just put your hands up real quick. Just real quick. And put it back down. Father, give our hearts the proper posture. A posture of humility. It's not us, it's you. A posture of love. Knowing how much you love the people that need your truth in their lives. Lord, help us to minister to them. Help us to be a light shining in the darkness. Help us to be the ones to storm the gates of hell and snatch people out. And we'll give you all of the praise and honor and glory because we know it's only by you and through your Holy Spirit that we can do it. In Jesus' name, amen.